Hello. In our lives, love is a noble and sacred emotion that, when expressed properly, brings happiness and gives meaning to life. However, not infrequently, love is blatantly exploited for various purposes. In this case, a woman exploited the love of different men to secure a comfortable life for herself. However, she did not anticipate that soon after, the very person she exploited would push her family into the depths of despair. On December 31st, 2011, a day that should have been filled with joyous New Year celebrations, the village of Shunli, in Juntan County, Henan Province, was instead shrouded in a gloomy and eerie atmosphere. Two villagers on their way to visit Chen Ai Ching's house found her door tightly closed. They knocked repeatedly but received no response. Sensing something was wrong, they peeked through a crack in the door and saw the courtyard covered in blood. Terrified, they called the police. When the police arrived, they found two bodies in the living room. A man with a deep wound on his neck, his face unrecognizable, and a woman with multiple head injuries. In the bedroom, the police discovered the bodies of a boy around seven years old and a girl around 10 years old, both with severe head and neck injuries. This horrifying massacre left the entire village in a state of panic and outrage. Through their investigation, the police learned that Ching had divorced and was raising three children alone. Her eldest daughter fortunately escaped the massacre because she was attending a boarding school. The man's body was identified as Yan Wei Feng, 40 years old from the same village with no apparent relation to Ching's family. So why was he there? During the autopsy, the forensic examiner found numerous injuries all over Ching's body, indicating that the perpetrator had taken out their anger on her. The police then expanded their investigation into Ching's social relationships. They quickly discovered a man nicknamed Little Northeast. According to the neighbors, he frequently visited Ching's house before the incident. Everyone in the village knew that BEI had lived with Ching for some time, and had many conflicts with Fung. On January 3, 2012, three days after the crime, the police arrested the suspect BEI in Changchun. His real name was An Yun Liu from Zonghua, Heilongjiang province. He had previously been convicted of theft twice and had been imprisoned. The story began 10 months earlier when An had just been released from prison and started working as a construction worker. At that time, An was content with his ordinary life. However, a kind friend introduced him to Ching. Ching had many good qualities, though she already had three children. Despite this, An didn't mind. Upon seeing a photo of Ching, An fell in love instantly. But when he learned that she was 11 years younger than him, he felt hesitant. He wondered how a beautiful young woman like Ching could be interested in an older man like him. However, An's good friend encouraged him to talk to her and see if they were compatible. So An called Ching. Their first conversation lasted a long time. Despite An being older and having been imprisoned twice, Ching was very proactive and soon called him two more times. From then on, they often talked until midnight. Ching felt that An was honest and sincere. She realized that he longed for care and love. Although An had a plain appearance and came from a poor background, this did not affect Ching's feelings for him. After their phone conversations, An hurriedly took a train to Yangchuan to meet Ching for the first time. When he saw Ching in person, he was completely captivated. She was a beautiful girl with a charming face and a radiant smile, which made him more confident in his decision. From that first meeting, An and Ching became a couple. In the following days, they spent a lot of time doing many things together. Their sweet love lasted for half a month. One day, Ching suddenly seemed sad. Under An's inquiry, she revealed that her children were about to start school and needed 8,000 yuan for tuition fees. Otherwise, they couldn't attend. But she didn't have the money at the moment. Hearing his lover's predicament, An felt very uncomfortable. Since they had already committed to their relationship, Ching's issues were also his. He didn't want Ching to worry, so An took on this burden. He sold 20 mu of his family's land and borrowed 10,000 yuan in cash, hoping to help Ching and her children stabilize their lives. At this time, An's sister warned him several times about being deceived, but An still wholeheartedly believed in love. With this money, An brought Ching and her two children to his hometown in the Northeast. There, they asked Ching's relative Wei to take care of the children while An went out to earn money. Their lives gradually stabilized, but soon after, Ching received news from a relative that her eldest daughter in Henan often caused trouble at school. This news worried Ching greatly, and An decided to bring the girl to live with them in the Northeast. The next day, An borrowed 4,000 yuan from his sister. Then he and Ching went to Henan to handle the school transfer for her daughter. After everything was settled, An invited Wei to a meal to express his gratitude for taking care of the children. However, 
During the meal, An felt very uneasy because Wei and Ching displayed their intimacy too obviously, even making An, who had little romantic experience, feel something was amiss. Their small, familiar gestures made An very uncomfortable. He once asked Ching about her relationship with this cousin, and although she firmly denied any wrongdoing, An still felt uneasy. However, An didn't want to dwell on this relationship. As long as Ching still wanted to live peacefully with him in the Northeast, he had no objections. So, the next day, Ching and her children set off. After returning to the Northeast, An devoted himself to taking care of the three children. Since he hadn't started a family by the age of over 40, he loved children very much. He took good care of the three kids and bore the entire financial burden of the family. However, his efforts were not reciprocated sincerely by Ching. With just one midnight phone call, Wei easily persuaded Ching to leave An. At that moment, An had just put the two children to bed and was about to rest when the phone rang. It was Wei calling. Although An didn't know what they were talking about, from Ching's scattered words, he could guess their relationship. However, he didn't dare to expose the truth because Ching was now pregnant with his child. If the truth were revealed, An would lose everything. But his fears soon came true. The next morning, Ching confessed the whole truth to An. She said that Wei was not her cousin but someone who had always pursued her. Ching admitted that she was torn, unable to abandon An, but also unable to forget Wei. She wanted to meet Wei to discuss and decide between the two. If she chose An, she promised to return immediately and live a peaceful life with him. Even if she chose Wei, she promised to repay all the money An had spent on her and cherished this affection and agreed to Ching's request. In the following days, An took care of the children carefully, eagerly waiting for Ching to return and build a home together. But his dream was shattered as after Ching left, An heard that she was living with Wei. Not long after, Ching returned to the Northeast to pick up her three children. Ordinarily, their matter would have ended there, but just a month later, Ching nonchalantly called An, asking him to transfer some money. Although An deeply loved Ching, he said they no longer had any relationship, and he was under no obligation to continue sending money. However, Ching's next words moved An. She said she hadn't chosen An before because her children didn't like the Northeast climate, but if An was willing to move to Pingyang, they could raise the children together. Hearing this, An, who had become indifferent, was touched again because he still loved Ching. At that moment, the sound of the children crying came through the phone, with the youngest saying they missed him and begging him to return. These words completely persuaded An, and he immediately set off for Pingyang. After that, they lived as husband and wife, and An borrowed an additional 30,000 yuan from friends and family to start a mushroom farming business. In the following period, the family's life gradually stabilized, but Ching became obsessed with gambling leaving the care of the children and the mushroom farm to An. An tried to stop her, but Ching scolded him. Enraged, An left, and when he returned, he found that Ching was openly living with Wei again. When An went to the house to confront them, Wei did not panic when caught, but deliberately provoked An, making Ching call Wei husband. This word husband further agitated An. He demanded that Ching return to the Northeast with him within 10 days or repay all the money he had spent. But there was no way Ching could easily repay the money. When An visited again, Ching not only ignored him, but also had Wei bring six or seven people to beat An up severely. After this incident, An could no longer contain his rage. On December 31st, he secretly carried a knife and snuck into Ching's house. He initially planned just to beat the two up, but outside the door, he overheard Wei and Ching talking. Wei said that with the new year approaching, they should call An to see if he had any money. If he did, they should ask him to send money for their New Year celebrations and then deal with him after the holidays. Hearing this, An's last hope was consumed by his fiery rage. He had thought that he had given all his affection to Ching and that she would build a happy home with him. Little did he know he was just an ATM. After that, he burst into the house with the knife, crazily attacking the couple. After killing the two, he feared that the children would wake up to see the scene, so he killed the two children under 10 years old. Only Ching's eldest daughter, who was boarding at school, escaped the calamity. Due to the deception and betrayal, Ching and Wei ultimately paid with their lives. After being arrested, An immediately admitted he was the perpetrator of the massacre of Ching's family. This shocked the neighbors, as although An hadn't lived there long and had a criminal past, he had reformed. Since starting his new life, An often helped others and had a good reputation in the village. According to An's confession, he had been driven to the brink and felt compelled to commit such a crazy act. No one knew how much pain and torment Anne endured after committing the crime. On April 24, 2013, the court sentenced On to death for intentional homicide. 
Before his execution, the prison arranged for Anne to meet his relatives. Facing his gathered family, Anne struggled to contain his emotions, but his sisters couldn't hold back and hugged him. This action moved even the guards. Through this case, we see that Anne's psyche was quite complex due to the many adversities he faced in life. In his youth, he had been imprisoned for theft, so we can't say Anne was a morally and psychologically good person. Perhaps his frequent help to the villagers made them gradually accept and forget his past. So, did his initial bad traits disappear? No one can answer this. But we must acknowledge that before the crime, Anne was a good father. Perhaps due to an incomplete childhood and the hardships and suffering in prison, Anne longed for a happy life and was striving for it every day. However, good things once again turned their back on him. A good wife would bring peace to the family, but his wife only saw him as an ATM. His efforts and affection for her and the family were shamelessly exploited. When Anne no longer had any value, he was mercilessly discarded. Thus, the negative emotions within him gradually grew and overwhelmed his rationality. In a moment of losing himself, he acted against the children he dearly loved. In the end, An's actions not only took others' lives, but also buried his future and left lifelong pain for those who remained. The woman in this case exploited the love of men to live comfortably. However, she never expected that the person she exploited would push her family into the abyss of despair and death. The case we're delving into today rocked the nation of over 1 billion people at the time. Not only was the identity of the deceased shrouded in mystery, but the case also involved a professional killer, leaving everyone outraged. What happened next was even more shocking. On August 18, 2006 in Zhuhai, Guangdong, a gray Jetta was parked on the roadside of a luxurious residential avenue. Since it was 4 a.m. and the streets were deserted, the car stood out. A security guard patrolling 24-7 passed by it several times, but initially didn't pay much attention. It wasn't until hours later, when he noticed the car still parked in the same spot, that he approached to investigate further. However, he was startled to find the seated posture of the woman in the passenger seat unchanged, her face expressionless, a clearly visible scar on her neck, her shirt soaked in blood, along with a man in the driver's seat who was injured. His head was bowed, eyes obscured, and his body covered in deep stab wounds. Witnessing this horrific scene, the security guard quickly called the police. Within minutes, the police arrived at the scene and immediately began a thorough investigation. After the forensic examination, it was concluded that both had died from excessive blood loss due to sharp instrument cuts severing their main arteries, and the time of death was around 12 p.m. that day. The killer's modus operandi was meticulous and clean, leading the police to speculate that he was a professional assassin. They later confirmed the victims to be well-known gamblers in Macau, named Zhu Nuo Hong and Lin Bao Thin, known as Sister Mao and Brother Mao. Clearly, this was a meticulously planned murder, and the murderer's methods were extremely ruthless. Upon closer inspection, the police concluded that there were definitely more than one killer involved in this case, and the Grey Jetta abandoned at the scene was rented from a car dealership around 5 p.m. the day before to travel to the Northeast region. First, let's explore who the victim couple were. Firstly, Jun Wo Hong, 50 years old, was known as Sister Mao and was a well-known gambling queen in Macau. In the early years, she only worked as a manager at the Lisboa Hotel, but due to her straightforward nature and excellent work abilities, she was recognized by senior leadership. By 1999, she had become a talented employee responsible for managing all key activities of the casino. By the end of 2005, Zhu Nuo Hong joined the Golden Palace, the VIP room on the fourth floor of the Lisboa Casino, as a manager and became the owner and director of Golden Palace, which had a total of six tables and was the highest betting hall in Macau, with monthly betting amounts reaching up to 20 billion yuan. As for Lin Bao Thin, Zhu Nuo Hong's husband initially worked in the garment industry, but because it was profitable, he also followed his wife into the gaming industry and became a casino broker. According to their friends, Zhu Nuo Hong was dubbed the incarnation of Quan Yin due to her rare kindness and righteousness. When the couple was buried at the Zhuhai funeral home, many relatives and friends attended and donated nearly 1 billion yuan, 
all of which was given to their daughter studying in the United Kingdom. Before the case was resolved, since both spouses were involved in a complex entertainment casino, there were many different opinions about the motive for their murder. Moreover, many of their friends worldwide expressed their intention to relentlessly pursue the deaths of Zhu Nuo Hong and Lin Bao Thien. Various hypotheses have been put forward as follows. Firstly, that Zhu Nuo Hong was conspired against by her colleagues due to intense competition in the VIP rooms of Macau casinos, where she may have incited jealousy by attracting major clients. Moreover, it's been suggested that the couple had previously ventured to the mainland to collect debts, but upon their deaths, the sums, amounting to billions, were stolen, indicating a possible motive related to money. Some even suspect that the location where the bodies were found wasn't the initial crime scene. Perhaps the couple was murdered on the road from Dongguan to Zhuhai before being moved to where they were discovered. Particularly noteworthy is the hypothesis that Zhu Nuo Hong, managing VIP rooms with high-stakes clients, often extended credit to familiar clients for bets amounting to tens or even hundreds of billions before seeking repayment. This is a common practice in Macau casinos, so Zhu Nuo Hong frequently traveled to the mainland to collect debts from clients. Rumors circulated that before leaving Macau, Zhu Nuo Hong had planned to meet a man named Diem in Zhu Hai, who managed a lottery store on the mainland to demand repayment of a debt exceeding 10 billion yuan before intending to vacation in the northeast region with her husband after completing the task. Therefore, many believe that during the debt collection process, she may have had a confrontation with the debtor, resulting in her murder. According to Macau police, it's rare for casino managers to be killed over debts, but this doesn't mean it hasn't happened before. Thus, amidst various speculations, the police remained focused on gathering evidence to uncover the truth and identify the murderer's identity. They collected a vast amount of information from surveillance cameras, including those in the three casinos where Zhu Nuo Hong worked, as well as places she frequented on the mainland, such as her residence and all the hotels and restaurants she visited. Additionally, the police investigated numerous individuals associated with her, among whom a key figure drew their attention, Zhu Hai Hong, Zhu Nuo Hong's younger brother. The police discovered that before she went to the mainland, Zhu Nuo Hong had transferred a large sum of money to Zhu Hai Hong's account. It's evident that Zhu Nuo Hong went to the mainland to collect debts, so why did she transfer a substantial amount of assets to her younger brother's name? This seems highly suspicious. Could she have known she wouldn't return? Therefore, the police swiftly seized this lead and initiated a detailed investigation into Zhu Hai Hong. Zhu Hai Hong, 48, frequently operated in Zhu Hai to assist his sister in reaching major clients. Upon observation, the police noted that he didn't appear particularly distraught after his sister's murder. What's more, what further aroused suspicion was that in the period leading up to the incident, Zhu Hai Hong had close ties to an individual in Guangdong named Chen Jia Jian, and another from Kuzhou named Li Yun Gang. However, after the incident, the three of them suddenly cut off all contact with each other. Consequently, the police immediately issued a cooperation request for investigation with Zhu Hai Hong's two friends. Chen Jia Jian, 42, from Zhongshan, Guangdong, had previously been convicted of intentional injury. After serving his sentence, he left his hometown and began working as a contract killer. Li Gang also had a criminal record. On August 20th, the police learned that Chen Jiajian might have fled to Tongnigia, so they immediately dispatched a special team to search the area. Upon arrival, they discovered Chen Jiajian hiding in a village, prompting them to collaborate with local authorities to ascertain the suspect's whereabouts. After three days of relentless effort, the police received information that Chen Jia Jian was fleeing to the mountainous region with very complicated terrain. Therefore, they took their police dogs along with local authorities and villagers to launch a search campaign in the mountains. Finally, around 5 a.m. on August 24th, Chen Jia Jian was apprehended. Upon investigation, the police found that Chen Jia Jian and Li and Gang were merely intermediaries responsible for finding the killer and were not directly involved in the case. 
Both confessed that it was Zhu Hai Hong who offered a reward of nearly 200 million yuan to hire them to search for the murderer. Subsequently, based on Chen Jia Jian's confession, the police discovered several leads and arrested several other suspects directly linked to the case. When confronted by the police, Zhu Hai Hong did not appear surprised, as if he had anticipated this day would come. After the interrogation, the information revealed shocked everyone, as no one thought it was a case where the victims hired their own killer. Zhu Nuo Hong and her husband owed over 340 billion yuan in high interest debt and were unable to repay it, so she begged her brother to hire a hitman to kill them. It turned out to be a contracted murder orchestrated by Zhu Nuo Hong and her husband. About a month before the incident, Zhu Nuo Hong met with Zhu Hai Hong to discuss business matters and told her brother that she was in debt and unable to repay, so she asked him to find someone to kill her and her husband. Zhu Hai Hong immediately refused. However, Zhu Nuo Hong cried and begged, saying she had considered suicide, but if she did, their debt would be transferred to their daughter. Therefore, to avoid implicating their daughter, Zhu Nuo Hong and her husband decided to turn it into a murder case. This way, they could be considered dead while performing official duties, and the casino would not only clear their debt, but also provide a pension to support their daughter. After hearing her sister's plea, Zhu Hai Hong finally relented. Zhu Nuo Hong then did three things. Firstly, she wrote a suicide note explaining everything clearly to avoid implicating her brother if the case was exposed. Secondly, she transferred most of the assets to her daughter's name and a portion to her brother's name. Finally, she provided nearly 200 million yuan to pay for hiring the hitman. On August 15th, three days before the incident, Chen Jia Jian found two professional hitmen, Fan Kanlai and Yang Chin Lam, and asked them to be extremely brutal on August 18th to make people believe that Jun Huo Hong and her husband had been killed. She tried her best to stage the scene, especially by telling everyone beforehand that she and her husband would go to the mainland to collect debts. Additionally, she intentionally went to a rental agency to rent a gray Jetta to make people believe they intended to travel to the Northeast. After arranging everything, they drove to the agreed-upon location and waited for the hitman to arrive. Because neither of them wanted to witness the death of the other, Zhu Nuo Hong asked the hitman to tie up and blindfold her husband before proceeding with her. When the police arrived at the scene, they found them dead holding hands tightly in the front row. In fact, Lam Bao Thin had nothing to do with these debts. So, he could have stayed out of it, but ultimately chose to die with his wife. This shows the intense affection between the two. According to Zhu Hai Hong's account, before hiring the hitman, his sister gave him a package of bills and letters. After determining their hiding place, the police quickly arrived and found the final letter that Zhu Nuo Hong wrote to her daughter, along with related bills in a safe. This crucially plays a role in uncovering the truth of this bizarre case and bringing it to justice. In the end, Zhu Hai Hong was sentenced to 12 years in prison, and several other murderers were also sentenced to 12 to 14 years in prison. Zhu Nuo Hong's actions have led gambling enthusiasts further into the abyss, while also exposing them to risks with no alternative choices. Whether winning or losing, there is ultimately an unfavorable outcome. And that's the story for today. Were you surprised by the outcome of the case? Leave your thoughts below the video. If possible, please support us by liking the video and subscribing to the channel to follow the next mysteries. Thank you and see you again. Goodbye.